Touch and Go started with the premise that it would avoid the conventions of the record business and behave in keeping with this sort of innate fairness that was a cornerstone of the punk rock scene. This is Chicago. Most traditional businesses operating on traditional business models where they're behaving defensively at every decision point, most of them go broke. If you're dealing with people that you have to protect yourself from, then you are sort of acknowledging the risk that your business associates will fuck you. If instead you treat everybody like a friend and a peer, and you treat everybody fairly, then you have no reason to presume that they will fuck you. That's what's significant about Touch and Go. Not that they, not, yes, it's great that they've survived. Yes, it's great that, every, that they've sold a bajillion records. Yes, it's great that they've established careers for a lot of bands. That's great. The significant thing is that they're doing it exactly the same way that they did when they started. I mean, Touch and Go didn't really start as a company by any means. We didn't know what we were doing. You know, nobody knew what they were doing, but those first records came out, there were a hundred of the Necros single and 200 of the Fix single. And that sounded like a lot, like who the hell's gonna buy these? You know, we, we only have like four friends and, you know, give one to my brother or something, you know, okay, where's the rest of them gonna go? Touch and Go, as a punk rock record label, saw the bands on the label, the people who were running the label, and the audience were a continuum. At any point, somebody could go from being in the audience to being in a band to helping to put out records. I mean, I remember before I was even into, you know, when I first started getting into punk rock, um, some of my favorite bands were on Touch and Go. I certainly never, when I was 16 or 17 years old, when I bought my first big black single, I never thought that I'd be a part of that. I've always put out music by bands whose music I really liked and by bands who uh, I felt like I'd enjoy working with on a personal level that, you know, people that I'd enjoy having dinner with or would let stay in my home or, you know, I, I don't want to work with assholes, you know. Touch and Go started with a small number of people and they are personally quite vested in Touch and Go's existence because it's their life's work, okay? It's Corey Rusk's life's work. The people who've been at that label for a long period of time, they feel like Touch and Go is part of their legacy as human beings, not just their job for the moment, but the existence of Touch and Go is culturally important and they feel like they've participated in it. I know I feel like I've participated in it. Touch and Go have treated it like it's art, you know. It's not just a, a means to procure some money to get some, you know, disposable income out of the pockets of the kids. From the artist's point of view, being able to make a record and work with, with Touch and Go is an extremely simple process. Just the straight dealing and just the honesty of the situation, which has been very nice on one level and also a revelation for the Mekons in all the deals we've had with labels before was refreshing and probably saved the band from just giving up. There's not a lot of red tape, there's no contracts. If there's no contract between a band and a label, then both parties are obliged to behave honorably. Because if the band behaves badly, they can't compel Touch and Go to carry on putting out their records. Touch and Go is obliged to treat the band fairly, because if the band feels like they're not getting a fair shake, they can go elsewhere you know, on a moment's notice. There is no pressure, I mean, it's, uh, which I think in a lot of aspects, not necessarily ours, uh, leaves for more creative records. But uh, sometimes you get a little lazy too. <laughs> Here we are. Yeah, we are the laziest <laughs> band on Touch and Go. There are a ton of records 
For musicians that may have stopped making music even 10 years ago or 15 years ago, those records are still there. Almost all of them are still available. I think many labels would consider that poor business sense, you know, to, to continue to manufacture records that you know, aren't big sellers. But Corey, you know, makes it work. Because Touch and Go has kept its records in print for a long period of time, it's given the maximum number of bands the greatest possibility to percolate into the culture. I go to record stores a lot. While I've been in record stores, I have never seen anyone come through the door and say, give me anything you have that's brand new. <laughs> you know, the novelty of a record doesn't really matter that much. I have seen an awful lot of people come in to record stores and say, there's this band that I just found out about. I'm not, I don't remember their name, but the song sort of goes like this. It may be a few years old. And the oral history within the record store allows somebody to answer that question and say, oh, what you're looking for is this record here, yada, yada, you know. And then they root around and they find it and ta-da, there's a moment of enlightenment for somebody. I think that's a significant relationship that people have with music and I'm glad that Touch and Go allows their bands and their audience to have that relationship. Just being able to extend the music and make it available and just shared, I think that's, that's an incredible uh, gift. It's like a conversation, you know between you and hopefully someone out there that might find something in your experiences or something about what you enjoy or the music you filtered through your systems, you know, some sort of connection. Being able to exist in this climate for 25 years is something just to kind of celebrate regardless, you know, especially in the music industry. When I was a teenager, music meant so much to me and I grew up in Toledo, Ohio, which there was nothing going on there then, and I'm pretty sure there's nothing going on there now. Sorry, Toledo. I, I think that certainly for myself and for kids then and now, music can be a form of communication, uh, an, an art form that gives them something that they can relate to. In terms of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis or the level of responsibility or that, you know, those sorts of things, that's all very different than, you know, doing it out of your bedroom when you're a kid. But the things I get out of it and the motivations behind it are still largely the same. You know, I, I still enjoy finding great new music and I still enjoy helping people that are making that music reach an audience and getting to know them while we're doing that. Music is so permanently intertwined with memories and emotions, and it, it becomes, yeah, it becomes inseparable with those things. And, and I think that the right music will speak to people in a way that nothing else will. Mm -hmm.